Hey, you want a hot tip? Today on Garden Time, we give you some tips for getting your garden ready for fall. What should you be doing and what should you avoid? We talk with our favorite extension agent, Jan McNeilan, and she fills us in on all you need to know. Next on Garden Time. Garden Time is brought to you by Capital Subaru in Salem, Oregon. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. Welcome to the Garden Time Podcast. We're based in the Pacific Northwest of the United States in a Zone 7 region. This deals with plants that can survive at approximately zero degrees Fahrenheit or warmer. I'm producer Jeff Gustin with your hosts, Judy Alaruzzo and Ryan Seeley. Welcome to Garden Time. And as you can see, we have a special guest this month or this podcast, mm -hmm. um, Jan McNeilan, who has been kind of our third host for many, many years on the Garden Time Show. We are meeting with her once a month for her tips of the month. And it has always been one of our most popular portions of the show is the tips of the month because we tell people what they could be doing at that time in their garden. Um, this is gonna be a little bit more broad ranging because we're gonna talk about the next couple months. So Jan, a little bit of your background for people who may have not seen the Garden Time TV show and the 17 years plus that we had you on. Background is interest in all things nature. So that started me out and then got a degree in landscape design and one in general science and then adult training and development and 20 some odd years with extension uh, in home horticulture as asking and answering as many questions in all areas that affect the garden. And you were state coordinator too for the Master Gardener yep, program. Yep, a couple times. Um, every time somebody new decided not to have the job anymore, <laughs> I got it in between. Yeah. When my husband Ray retired, then I then I was the interim extension agent for the three metro counties in Portland and the statewide coordinator. Cool. And when we talk about OSU, <laughs> we're talking about the Oregon State University Extension, not uh, Ohio State love those guys but we're talking Oregon State and in case people are wondering we're also talking about uh, tips that primarily apply to Oregon Washington west of the Cascades though these can be applied to multiple areas around the country just based on timing and temperature and climate and yes yeah. there's an ex there is an extension office in every county in every state and if sometimes there's metro counties and there's one agent for three counties, but you can get localized information if, say, you're east of the mountains mm -hmm. and in central Oregon or eastern Oregon, Washington, uh, you can get location-specific information for wherever you are if it's not in the Willamette Valley. So just type in extension service in yes. your area and you yes. should find it. Yep. Um, so Jan, you put together, once again, you saved uh, the rest of us time, <laughs> <laughs> and you, you put together a list of things that um, people should be considering going into fall. And we are now, in some parts of the country, experiencing fall-like conditions. Sure. So um, you talked about garden evaluation. So what do you mean by garden evaluation? At this time of year, the best thing to do is to go outside and look around and what looks good and what doesn't. And it, it, those plants will tell you if they're in the right place or not. And so if they're in too much sun and we've had hot weather, you know that you've had to water them more and even if you do they're not making it yeah. so um, i have an example of a hydrangea that i've dumped so much water on and a gorgeous fern right next to it that i haven't and the fern looks great and the hydrangea no matter what i do really doesn't look good so it goes <laughs> i mean i i'm not going to do that next year um, so I may get some more of the same kind of fern for that area so that it looks good. Um, so it's, it's just 
looking to see is it in too much shade does it does the plant bloom does it need sun to bloom does it, it got hostas or shade loving plants are they frying if they are they're likely in too much sun and prefer shade so just go through slowly big garden small garden or even pots on a deck and evaluate how things have have done this year so in <laughs> in addition to possibly moving plants looking at irrigation needs and putting like plants with with similar needs together i would imagine would figure into that as well yeah absolutely that's the thing if you've got a lot of plants that need a lot of water they ought to be in one spot rather than uh, spread out throughout the garden that's smart i have a uh, flag tape and i've, I've had five things already that i flag that have yeah. to move yeah and they've just been struggling for years and years and it's like so you've kind of it's like crazy. spurred me out <laughs> it's crazy but it, it is crazy and they yeah. just look poor and yeah. it's like why am i doing that yeah. why am i letting that happen well and people that know us think we should have these perfectly beautiful <laughs> gardens, which is not necessarily. <laughs> we try. We, we try, try, don't yeah, we? Yeah, we do. And, I'm, you know, I've, I've been looking at actually taking pictures mm. of my garden now as to, you oh, know, what does yeah. it look like now when it's still leafed out, mm -hmm. it yeah. hasn't died back yet. Because right. I make the mistake every year, I'll go, oh, I need to move this. Right. And I wait till it's gone dormant as of every other thing around it. Yeah. And I kind of forget where things are <laughs> right. yeah. or where to move it to. So sure. if I take pictures now, I can look back and be like, Good oh, idea. I need to go have a reference of a landmark of some boulder sure. or stone that I, okay, put it over here or sure. flag it, you know, with your flagging river or no, whatever it's now, but it's what it looks like now versus what it looks like right. yeah. here in another month or two yeah. or three or four right. is a totally different story. Right. So are you going in and cleaning up plants now? I always clean up plants. Because <laughs> we were talking earlier about uh, pruning and, yeah. the, you know, it's late summer mm -hmm. in, into fall, probably early fall, for some plants, maybe you do want to prune and some you don't want to prune. Mm. So you had a story that at the nursery, uh, somebody was doing some pruning. Yeah, I really think that this it's too late to just do general pruning because we're not gonna get cold usually. We don't get cold until Halloween. And so plants can put on growth and then it's soft and then we get hit with a frost and then you might lose branches or you might even lose that plant. So like annuals, you had mentioned uh, Jan, annuals, I noticed in your notes you're talking about cleaning up annuals that are spent and mm. sure. you know, and that kind of thing. So sure. those would be okay. But, sure. Yeah. Okay. But a lot of times with perennials too, if you prune them, you're pruning off the blooms for next year. So there are um, like lilacs. If you were to go in and cut, they're setting uh, rhododendrons. They're setting their blooms already in August, correct? Yeah, absolutely. As yeah. soon as they're done blooming, they're setting new buds on the new growth. So if camellias, rhododendrons, any spring blooming shrub, if, you gonna, if you're gonna prune it, that's when you prune it. You don't wait till midsummer or fall because, I mean, you can, but you just won't have any blooms or very few the following year. But then, but then there are things, you know, you were talking hydrangeas, which is a totally different yeah. ball game where you do wanna do some pruning. Right you know, in the late late summer or fall, because if you wait too far into the fall or spring and then prune, then you get into the same right. problem where you're right. pruning off next year's right. Well, there's some really good information and some information sheets either at the Extension, the university website, um, or even there's another one we'll give you later, but um, our local Clackamas County Master Gardeners mm -hmm. here in Portland have multiple sheets on how to do everything, and I'm assuming um, that there's one on how to prune hydrangeas right. and when. Right. And there's lots of good illustrations. Mm -hmm. So if you're a visual learner, mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to be able to see where to cut and when. Right. But people like that clean look. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And it's hard to mm -hmm. get people not to prune and not yeah. to, we talk about in fall when leaves fall, about raking them into beds and using them as a protective mulch. And a lot of people don't like that. I know that. Yeah. And it's, oh. they're willing to pay to have somebody take the leaves away, compost them, and then came, come back and, <laughs> yeah. and, and then, buy it back. <laughs> and then you buy it back. <laughs> but, but I think it's important to talk, to touch base too on, on pruning and maybe like the different types of pruning. Cause sometimes there's pruning for shape and form. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times they're pruning for, for structure or if there's been, been disease or damage. Right. Absolutely. To right. the plant. So there are, 
some differences. I don't know, if, Jan, if you have any. Well, any kind of pruning, the first thing you do is crossing branches, diseased wood, it, broken wood, uh, or what, you know, that's the thing you're going to do first. Um, but true, there's certainly lots of approaches depending on what the plant is. So look it up, find out what the recommendations are, and, uh, and then f follow that. And, and, you know, some people like to pollard trees, which you take, they look like lollipops, lollipops. when you're done. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, it's all the aesthetics mm -hmm. and what you like. If you know that when you prune it hard, at the wrong time of year, it's going to be the shape you want, but it's not going to give you the color you want. Right. Uh, we were talking about uh, pruning roses. A lot of people love roses. And um, like Judy mentioned, if you prune roses back, um, you will get new growth. But here in the Northwest, roses can continue to grow even in really cold weather. They can. They just slow down. Mm -hmm. and, but you're going to lose that new growth if it does start to grow. But you're not going to lose the plant necessarily, correct? Right. Um, yeah, it'll throw more growth if part of it freezes. It's, if it's alive, it's still going to shoot uh, new growth. What we do with roses here is in the fall, you don't prune them per se, but you take them down if they're tall to hip high so that the winter winds won't rock the root system. Uh, and that's the only pruning you do in the fall. And then here in, in this zone of eight, um, USDA zone, we prune them the end of February, and then you can prune them really hard. Okay. And the earlier you prune them and the lower you prune them, the more roses you're going to have because roses bloom on new wood, as do a lot of shrubs, but some bloom on second year wood. So you don't want to take out unless you know which one requires what. Yeah. Well, you know, over the years in Garden Time and our archives, we have so many good pruning um, videos on there and it's so nice to see it and we really kind of went in depth you know with yeah. all of our, our visitors that we had or um, the people that we went to see yeah I mean because we've done you know visiting you know rose gardens and talking to mm -hmm. rose growers and breeders and the gardens on just pruning right. pruning roses mm -hmm. or you know visiting you know hydrangea yeah. on just pruning hydrangeas and how to grow those so like you do saying you know sure. there are so many great articles that are in mm -hmm. there and like Jan was saying too even on their USU extension site has right specific articles just for that because it can be overwhelming oh, when yeah. you look at your entire yard and we're telling you, oh to prune this now but not don't right, prune this yeah. now and it's like what you know it's yeah. well you could also go on the rose society website the camellia society mm -hmm. uh, chrysanthemum society <laughs> right. sure. each one and you know that those are the people that know the most about that one specific right. plant and right. you can usually get some really good information and if you're really into those plants in that group, mm -hmm. you can join them because sure. everybody's always looking for members and there's sure, nothing sure. like having all that information. Mm -hmm. So you have written down here, cut back perennials. So we're just taught, since we're talking about per, um, pruning, you're t saying three to six inches and that's just on specific ones or is that on like low growers? It's not necessarily on all of them because some of the perennials, the wind, even the dead dry growth is, is a nice feature mm -hmm. in the, in the winter. And Judy actually has a right. uh, here echinacea here. Echinacea. And so it has one bloom that's spent and one that's pretty close to being spent. Mm -hmm. But this one here, you could prune back or you could it, leave it. Right. right. But you don't necessarily have to prune it low. You could just take it, just literally deadhead it rather mm -hmm. than take much of the growth out. This growth may die off in the winter, but new growth is going to come up in the spring and it's going to. Uh, it's going to grow again. Yeah. And this is a about a 12 hardy. inches and you're taking about 6 inches right. off this. Taking off the, I would go just down to here and just literally deadhead because so actually here's, yeah. here's another bloom yeah. coming yeah. Yeah. right yeah. now. Yeah. And Judy brought this too because of saving seeds because there's lots of ways to do that. As and we well. have right. that, as we're on the mm -hmm. list, I, I know that we were talking about that. And let's just shift gear since we have this echinacea here and the seed head is here. A lot of people um, will go out and buy seed, and a lot of people are seed savers. And so uh, what's the benefit of being a seed saver? Money. <laughs> <laughs> lots and lots of money. Um, it's just the challenge, I think, uh, just of growing it yourself, saving the seed mm -hmm. and having that seed be viable seed. If the plant is healthy and the birds don't get to it first, 
uh, you've got some good seed and you dry it, make sure it's in a dry place, a dark place uh, for the winter and then in the spring if you want to see if it's viable seed you can get a damp paper towel and sprinkle some of the seed on it and see what the germination is and usually you're going to get if it's good seed 60 70 percent mm -hmm. but if it's like 10 percent don't bother yeah. 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 yeah yeah and a lot of people when you plant that seed it ne might not necessarily be the variety yeah. that you want because yeah. of cross pollination yeah, yeah. so it's you're crossed. going to get maybe the next great heirloom tomato yeah. the only yeah. way you're going to get this plant is to divide it rather than save the seed and plant it you're not you're right you're not going to get but the still exact same. it's still it can, a, yeah. it can be fun yes. well <laughs> yeah. there's yeah. a lot of fun in in uh growing seeds mm -hmm. and and finding that's how new varieties come up well or you could let the animals do it for you yeah because uh, <laughs> we have hellebores that pop up everywhere mm -hmm. because we don't get the seed heads off after the spring because we're yeah. busy right. weeding all the time yeah. Yeah. and so we have little seedling hellebores that pop up and so that's a benefit of nature too. Sure, is that it'll sure. do whatever you don't want yeah, to. Sure. So, yeah. But are there often, you know, you're talking about, you know, the seed heads, and you talked about birds and, mm -hmm. and pollinators too. Where you know, leaving some of these seed right, heads right. on mm -hmm. provides, you know, ha habitat and food. And sure. For like for, sunflower yeah. seeds. That's right. You know, yeah. So heads. Judy has a the, millet. The millet, here. and so people that are gluten intolerant, their millet is probably in the flower that they have. But this is ornamental millet. It's really kind of cool, kind of looks like a cattail. And I always love these. It looks like corn with this cool kind of flower. Um, but I love these, and then I leave them up for the birds. And usually it gets kind of picked, picked over in the sure. wintertime. Yeah. Um, but it's really, it's ornamental. It's great for winter interest. Yeah. So I just think that's kind of And it's of funny because I did, um, Mike Darcy, we talked about him being a local gardening guru. And he would you know, get millet for his bird feeders. Oh, sure. And he'd always say, fill it with millet, say no to Milo. And Milo's another seed, and it's not necessarily a favorite seed mm, no, uh, gets, for birds, but dumb. millet is. Yeah, right. And it is a beautiful plant. It looks like a purple corn yeah, stalk. Yeah, so it's, it's cool. And it's beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. One more thing about leaving, you know why I leave my perennials off? I, I don't cut them. Some people want to cut them all the way down because sometimes in the winter I'm planting things, and it's like, oh, I'm, I have an empty spot right there. I'm going to put something, and then I find a crown. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Like, oh, darn it. <laughs> I have a bamboo, clumping bamboo, and I cut the stakes, and I put them at the end of the season. Oh, I put idea. them everywhere there's a plant so mm -hmm. that over the winter, especially I'm really good in the spring, stepping on oh, yes. hostas, mm -hmm. snapping them off, <laughs> yes. not knowing exactly where they are. So I've been doing that for a while and uh, a it helps, yeah. it, like you say, then at least right. you know where to start if you're going to put in anything different. Right, right. And this is a good lesson. You, yeah. you, we walk on things all the time <laughs> yeah, in the garden. Sure. You dig up bulbs when you're planting stuff. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So. yeah. It's the bulbs. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's um, I put stakes where those are. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to, we have next down? on here about planting, but I want to save that for our second half because that is like a, there's a lot of information that goes into planting. And um, so what was the next thing That's is nice. uh, bringing house plants inside. Um, so a lot of people don't believe in taking their house plants outside. They're afraid to, but house plants can perform anywhere. They, they're normally outdoor plants in some part of the world. <laughs> um, they don't live in a house when they start. Um, so let's talk about what to do with house plants before we bring them back in. I have a lot of Christmas cactus, Easter cactus, whatever, Thanksgiving cactus. Um, and I take them outside. They, they're more apt to set blooms when they're outside because the light is so good. But I bring them in in the fall. Uh, they can take, actually, I can wait a long time mm. because they can take a lot of cold. And, you, and the buds are set, and you bring them in the house, and it's warm, and bang, the whole thing blooms, and it's too soon. Yeah. Aww. So I leave those out as long as I can. Any other house plants that I've put out, uh, I prune it back, clean it up, make sure there's no insects on it, just toes it off if you need to, uh, and then I replace uh, the top inch or so of soil, take that out and put new soil in because if there's any insects that are in that soil you're removing the eggs and you, you won't uh, propagate them in the house in the winter. 
Yeah, good, good point. I do, I do a lot of independent experimenting the last couple of years of doing a lot of house plants in mixed containers nice. out, out on my, mm -hmm. on my patio. Mm -hmm. And if this year they've, they've thrived just with, with the heat and the warmth, they're under kind of a covered partial shady mm -hmm. area. So they're not getting the direct sunlight and they're, you know, alocasias that are oh, getting, beautiful. getting huge and some of the ferns and these other house plants that are doing really well. So as I'm looking at, you know, fall that's coming up and when it starts to get cool, I'm not, I can't haul in this big 18 inch ceramic yeah. container into the house. Mm -hmm. um, so what I'll end up doing is kind of evaluating what do I want to save in there, knowing that I'm not going to keep them all and I just treat them as an annual. The things that have performed really well that I want to keep, mm -hmm. I'm just going to dig them up individually and then repot them. So that's a good time where you're yeah. going to get, you're going to get the fresh soil on them. Yeah, it gives you that chance to kind of mm -hmm. clean them up right. and evaluate them. And then I'll bring them in and use them as a house plant there. The next spring, if I want to, I can take them back out and, and reuse them again and again. Sure, sure, sure. add to it and change up my mixes. At and that point, you might also look to see if there's any root-bound plants that you've got and do some root pruning just to when you right. repot. Mm, right. That's a good idea. Yeah. yeah. And you can always go visit an independent garden center the next spring, too. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Throw them all away and go buy new. <laughs> <laughs> well, and we had done a story on Garden Time about mixing perennials and, and indoor plants and yes. using them mm -hmm. to bring that interest you know, outside, knowing that you're going to eventually either have to transplant those mm -hmm. indoor right. plants, bring them in, or just let them go and nature do their thing and then replace them with other things too. Right. So, yep. um, and talk about protecting sensitive plants. And I know you sent me a picture and we yeah. have a banana here in our yard. And uh, bananas and plants like that are just spectacular. And that banana is not going to go into a pot and come into our house. <laughs> and so what is your recommendation for plants like that? Well, my next door neighbor has a big banana and it's beautiful. I had sent you a photograph. Musa, uh, it was Musa Bastu mm -hmm. is, I believe, the variety. And it's hardy yeah. for us here. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. very much so. Yeah. But it is, unless you give it some protection on a harder winter, it mm -hmm. may not survive. Right. And so what uh, these the neighbors are new the people before that are the ones that planted the banana so i taught them how last winter to winter it over mm -hmm. and so w what he did he had bubble wrap first then he made a chicken wire cage for around the base mm -hmm. and stuffed we, and he actually wet leaves and put them in so he could get a lot of leaves in there. <laughs> so it made it really uh, thick uh, to protect the trunk. But you cut the top off and depends on how tall you want. If you want it to keep getting taller, you cut it up higher and higher and protect, protect a really tall trunk. Mm -hmm. Or if you want it to be smaller, you cut it. You can cut it way down. It's going to come back and then you only have a, a short trunk to protect mm -hmm. instead. But there's a lot of sensitive plants that are marginal here, like the Brugmansia that I have, the angel trumpet, uh, that last year was just ready to bloom. And I was leaving town and I knew there were buds all over it. So I drug it, and it's not one that you cart around easily, drug mm -hmm. it into the greenhouse. And when I came home from that trip, it had 47 blooms on it. Yeah. Oh. So if you have an, the option to protect it, yeah. that's great. You know, um, not, but I think it's important to mention, you know, you talked about using bubble wrap. Mm -hmm. You know, there are things to insulate that do better with others. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. people think of like, okay, I'll wrap a blanket mm -hmm. yeah. around there. But you know, once, it, once it rains it's and yes, gets yeah. wet, mm -hmm. and then if that blanket freezes, you've just yeah. encapsulated yeah. it in, a, in yeah. an ice cube. Exactly. Right. So it's, exactly. So Especially with bananas, because the one thing that surprised me when we cut ours back is how much water that so they're nice. heavy, yeah. but they're easy to cut. I mean, it's almost like a butter knife to it's get like through. Like celery. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> it is incredible. Yeah. So you cut through, and it you know it wastes a ton because it's just so much. Mm -hmm. It's so full of water, mm -hmm. uh, but that water will freeze, mm -hmm. and so you that's bet. why you need that protection. Yeah. So. Absolutely, and you take the, all those leaves though that you cut off and use them as mulch. Or mm -hmm. if you have an area that's real weedy put those banana leaves over it and it's going to smother out uh, and keep the light from hitting any kind of weeds yeah. or grass mm -hmm. or whatever it is you may not want. I'll do, I'll do the same. I have one of the, like, the big you know, gunner, the big dinosaur yeah. oh, yeah, food, you know, where the leaves can get to be you know, four or five, six feet across and, and 
if they can, but I will take the, cut those leaves and then just pile all those leaves just to pr protect the crown yeah. in, in the wintertime. Yeah, and dahlias are one thing that people, if you choose not to dig them, uh, that you put mulch on and protect them, but you keep, keep in mind that it has a stem that's pretty hollow, and if you don't put enough mulch on them, you're gonna get water down and it'll, uh, It'll kill the... It'll rot the, out. The, yeah. I've put newspaper first and then yeah. mulch, yeah. and it really worked yeah. because I don't have time to dig them. And yeah. I don't no. have anywhere to put them. It's like to each its own, yeah. survive, or that's it. Yeah. 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 I know yeah. that they're beautiful, and it's like, oh, th oh this is a good just, way to go. I put them in last year, and this year they're just gorgeous. It was they're, a good year for They're tennis. like yeah. three times taller than they were oh, last year. Oh, my gosh. Year. Yeah. It's great. Oh. Um, and then you have protecting potted plants, and uh, I know we've done this on the show about... Those that you can't bring in, there are ways of protecting them outside, including wrapping them, but... Right. Yeah. But that, that depends on how many pots you have. <laughs> uh, but yes, we've talked about it many times. I do it every year. We cover it every year. I take every pot I can, and they get bigger and heavier. Uh, so <laughs> I got a, a really sturdy dolly that I can... Uh, maneuver underneath the pot and get it moved around but I put it all on the south side of the house that gets winter sun and then blow with a leaf blower or a rake anyway every leaf I have in the whole yard goes on those pots Smart. Yeah. but um, you have to make sure that you pull them pull the leaves off in time or you have it looks like white asparagus when your uh, daffodils growth, yeah. are coming up and they don't turn green and they're flopping. So yeah. you have to, uh, what I do now is group them so I know which ones are, have bulbs in them and, and mm -hmm. take that. Because the bulbs can take a lot more cold than some mm -hmm. other more sensitive yeah. plants. And then you said you bring them up underneath the eaves and so do you have to worry about watering those plants? It's not under the eaves. Okay. It's just at the, the literally the wall okay. of the garden and, and it faces south and the, there's a tree there now but in the winter the, the leaves are gone and, yeah. and uh, it makes a good spot. But if but, someone brought them up though near the house, would they have to worry about watering the plants? I mean, if it's if it's over, yeah. If there's an overhang, yes. Uh, anything that's under an overhang, a rhododendron that's under an overhang or a shrub, then it's something that you need to consider. It's in that rain shadow. Yeah. 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 Don't your neighbors look? You make you look like a crazy person. You're out there watering. Right. Winter, I know. Your neighbors must think. You talk about you know piling <laughs> leaves on the top. You know, but when you're in containers and you know everything's more exposed as far as down by the roots, do you need to be concerned about insula well, I, insulating the pots or sure. by having well, them all grouped together? Well, kind of they're outside. grouped together against each other, and it's not just over the tops. It's actually you can't see the pots anymore oh, at all. It's like a big leaf body you yeah. want to dive <laughs> yeah, into, but don't jump don't beware. In. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a crazy person. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and speaking of crazy people, um, we're going to take a break and listen uh, to a message from Capital Subaru in Salem, and we will be back with even more tips <laughs> on Garden Time. Start your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure, we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway. And welcome back uh, to the podcast, to Garden Time. Um, we are talking with Jan McNeilan from OSU Extension, Oregon State University Extension. And uh, we are talking about garden tips going into the fall. And uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about planting because we always tell people fall is the time for planting. And really, Jan, um, any time of the year is a good time for planting. Right? Well, it can be. Um, fall is the best time just because... Uh, plants get such a good head start for spring because our soils, as Ryan was mentioning yeah. earlier, that our soils are, uh, they don't, for, at least for us in this zone in eight, don't freeze. Uh, in other parts of Oregon and eastern 
Oregon and Eastern Washington, they do. And and as I said earlier, contacting your local extension office and knowing what your requirements are for your area is best. But planting in the fall is a is a great idea. Um, there's only one issue, and that is you don't always find the plants you want. Oh, that is yeah. true. So, because uh, by that time, a lot of people have yeah. planted right. plants. Right. So uh, keep in mind that you might want to buy plants earlier in the year, keep them watered, and then plant them in the fall. Good point, good point. And you talked about the importance of water, and we've talked about uh, mudding in, and that even though you're putting that plant in, to eliminate that transplant shock, right. you really want to make sure that they're well watered. Right. Um, what you do is you you dig the hole to be as deep as the root ball. You don't want to get it deeper because that plant will settle and then it'll be lower than it needs to be. So just as deep as the root ball and twice as wide. And then put a hole or put a hose in the hole and fill that with water. Um, I don't necessarily recommend that you backfill it with any kind of potting soil or anything like that. Native soil is best because that's what it has to grow in. Uh, and I, with our clay soils here, you dig a hole, it's clay, and you put potting soil in it in the plant, and what you've done is you've created a nice pot for it that will fill with water. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you want the native soil, and then you put that hose in, get it good and wet, and uh, put the plant in the hole and then poke the ho hose around and get the air pockets out, push it down, especially shrubs and trees can take a lot of pressure. It's not like a little seedling. So you could step on it if you want all the way around that plant and get it really solid. And then continue to water. A lot of times people think if they're told that they need to water new plants, they do once yeah. and, and then they lose it because and and Judy, we talked about the, the garden centers have mm -hmm. always pushed fall as the time for planting, correct? Right. And it, we always recommend it because uh, the temperatures are getting cooler. It is going to start raining. So maybe you don't have to water as much, but you do have to pay attention. Um, and because our soils don't freeze, um, there's actually root activity, which you would think, yeah, it's wintertime, nothing's going on, the top of the plant isn't growing, but actually the roots are growing. And so that plant is gonna be ahead of the game come the spring. Um, if you would put a plant in as a comparison in March or April, the one that was planted in the fall is gonna take off much faster than that one that's planted in the spring. Right. It's funny because we talk about uh, perennials uh, sleep, creep, and leap right. for the three years. So the first year they sleep, they pretty much just stay in their space. The second year, you can see some perennials starting to move out. And by the third year, they've established mm -hmm. themselves and they really kind of go to town. Right. And Ryan, you yeah. see that because you go around and yeah, look yeah, at plants I, all I the time. see it all over. But, you know, you know, get back to the, you know, the kind of the planting, you know, with, you know, the mudding in method. You know, mm. you don't have to limit yourself to just fall. Right. You can plant in the middle of summer. And I'm, you know, obviously guilty of that because I plant <laughs> any time. It's, my shovel is sharp. Um, but, you know, you look at, you know, fertilizing, you know, in, in the spring, we do a lot of like start, starter fertilizers mm -hmm. and fertilizing, but you know, in the fall when you're planting, do you necessarily need to be promoting a lot of fertilizer and growth when you're planting in the fall? Uh, I would use slow release, more of a, uh, not a quick release f okay. fertilizer at all, uh, an organic one, um, and it'll just blend in with the soil and it'll be there for, instead of, getting rid of it right away in the soil as, a, right. as the rains wash it's a slow release so in the spring it'll be ready to and a lot of those slow release are, are temperature driven too mm -hmm. so, right exactly so when it gets so colder they're gonna not going to release right, because right. you yeah. don't want to promote and flush a lot of new growth right. tender new growth right. in the fall where you have potential freezing weather mm -hmm. coming up right. that could damage it so. absolutely and those uh, uh, slow release are generally like pelletized or mm -hmm. little tiny pearls and we always tell people to work them into the soil so that way they can stay moist and then actually do mm -hmm. something because it if needs you, to stay moist because if you put it on the top and it dries out before yeah, the rains come right. or you water it's not going to be it's functional. not doing anything right. yeah. 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 so um we have bulbs we talked a little bit judy brought some bulbs here we have uh what do we have judy so we have garlic, and so that's one of the things I think vegetables, it's kind of a vegetable, you, you think about, oh yeah, I love garlic, and when do I plant it? But if you plant it now, you're harvesting July, 
July yeah. or so. So, um, and then you want to take it apart. Like this is what you would buy in the grocery store. It's a bulb. You know, if you can think about the garlic you buy in the produce, it's a big bulb. And when you take it apart, there's all the little all cloves. The little cloves yeah. And that's what you use for your recipes. Well, when you plant it, you have to take it apart too. You don't plant this whole thing. So when you open it up, there's all the cloves there. Um, and then you plant each one. And does it matter how you plant them? You know, I think bulbs are really smart. <laughs> smart <laughs> and so yeah. you put it in and it'll figure out how to yeah. go. <laughs> Which way's up? Yeah, because we always heard, you know, the, the pointy side or nose right. up, you know, toes to the, to the bottom. But really, it doesn't matter. We've been to the Wooden Shoe Tulip Company yeah. and they plant them in large nets and they don't make sure mm -hmm. that. Yeah. The bulbs yeah, pointed no anyway, down. they right. just yeah. plant them and then when they harvest them, they just pull the nets up, right. which allows them right. to not lose the bulbs. I mean, if you're planting 10 or 12 of them and the tulip bulbs are really, you can see there's that nose or the point and then there's the flat part on the bottom, that's where the roots are. I mean, if you want to be more precise, yeah, do it that way. But just realize that if you're having someone help or your kids are helping, right. you mm -hmm. know, and it would be like, it's fun to do that. It's a great project. Um, don't worry if they're planting them upside down because they're gonna go they're gonna go upright. Um, and then this one in the middle, you can kind of tell the daffodil. daffodils have a taller neck. Um, and they they're, they do have like a point each side too. And sometimes with, it's funny, the daffodils always have old roots on it. So you can kind of see where those roots were. Um, but you know, the information on packages, we always say that like with seeds and everything, there's so much information on the package. So read the package. It'll tell you how deep, how far apart, when they're gonna come up, how tall they're gonna be. And infinitum. Yeah, and that, that's important to know the depth yeah. um, when you're planting a bulb, too. So Also, with the garlic, um, although you can buy it in the grocery store, it's best to get yeah, so this true. kind of yeah. garlic that's in the nurseries because um, a lot of times onions and garlic, they're uh, treated with a non -s mm. no sprout, right. and, and you want to start out with just the garlic. Right. Right. You don't want a growth inhibitor right. Right. when you're planting. Because potatoes no. are like that too, right? Yeah. 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 However, they, they do seem to if sprout. They sprout, 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 sprout yeah. <laughs> if, <laughs> and if you leave them in the ground and miss a few, they mm -hmm. come they, back they up the next yeah. year. Yeah. So. And, and Ryan, do you want to give us a tip about tulips with deer? <laughs> Since you have deer, they, they love them. <laughs> it's like candy they do. for the deer. Just they, yeah. take that bud they do, right you know, out. I, do, I have a, a buck and a mom and a couple of fawns that graze my yard, and I will watch them. My neighbor has a beautiful patch of, of tulips. I gave up on tulips years ago. I bet. I bet. But I'll watch them go through. Just take a bite. Yep. Just Aww. one. Just pluck the top off and work its way through, and it's just like candy Aww. for yeah. them. It's just like you know. And now some people have said you plant, uh, you know. Um, daffodils or narcissus around them because they the deer don't eat those as right. as much and so well, if maybe you, plant your garlic in them well, there yeah right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well seasoning for the deer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah it's like going good. but if they're hungry oh, yeah. they're right. yeah. really yeah. yeah. but it's you know you, you know people like you, Judy and I were talking earlier about you know, everybody thinks of like you know tulips and apples in the spring and they come into the garden center in the spring yeah. and you know they see them blooming in people's yards I want my tulip bulbs you have to think backwards because yeah, okay. you know fall is the time that yeah. you that you're going to find the daffodils and the tulip bulbs, and that's when the time you need need to plant them so you get them to grow. And right, right. And the bulbs that you buy are already have enough nutrients mm -hmm. in them that they will bloom. So if you've got a bag of bulbs sitting around in December, they're not going to hold another right. year. Right. So plant them. Right. If you could get them in the ground, plant them because you will have. You will right. have some flowers, even though you're terribly late. And don't you plant yours in pots too? I put mine in pots, and just that's a great idea too. It just yeah. they just get in the way otherwise. <laughs> in this way, when they start to die down and they're done blooming, I can move them. Mm -hmm. I don't have to, you know, close. I can deadhead them, but I, I can move them around and and uh, have the spectacular. Because I'm, I'm always finding my bulbs every time oh, I'm yeah, digging yeah, everything yeah, around yeah. my yard. I forget where they are. Yeah, and for sure. Yeah, and for people that don't have a lot of space, I think that's a great they're idea. Great. Yeah, yeah it works for me. Mm -hmm. And I can get some things to grow, like uh, Fritillaria chocolate lilies oh. do better in pots than they right. do in the ground oh, for me. That's a special one, yeah. Because drainage. Yep. Because you'll know, yeah. you have, have some yeah. areas where I have some heavier clay soils yeah. and some lower areas where my tulips will rot out yeah. in the wintertime, and I don't want to go 
right? Yeah. No, no. And you mentioned they have enough food in there, and so that kind of leads us into the whole, the other point you put on your list about enriching the soil. For mm-hmm. a lot of plants, um, they don't have all that energy. A lot of times, they need a little bit of oomph to get through the winter. Um, so, what exactly would you do to enrich the soil? Um, well, the, the best thing to do is to incorporate uh, leaves and mulch and anything that can break down. Um, fertilizer, yes, but especially with clay soils that some people fight all the time, <laughs> the more organic material you put in that soil, the better it's going to be. I mean, over the years, I've been in the same with the same garden for a long time, and, and uh, the soils are pretty fluffy now and uh you know they don't make slurpy noises when you put the shovel in <laughs> that's nice <laughs> so uh and you could use uh there again in the fall it's better to use a slow release fertilizer rather than because you like you say you don't want to um, have that new growth pop at the wrong time of year mm. so if you're if you're raking you know we've done done stories on raking all of your leaves you know in in your beds to you know protect your perennials and you know, but we've also talked about, you know, what about like the bugs and disease and things like that that you might be introducing mm-hmm. or bringing in? How, how are you treating That's that? certainly a question of people think, oh, you know, there'll be more slugs under there, there'll be more uh, insects, but also you're leaving a place and there's more beneficial insects the same True. that mm-hmm. are uh, predators of the bad guys. Uh, so I've never felt like I have any trouble with more insect uh, related problems at all yeah. by using because I've done it for years um, it's just a lazy man's way to <laughs> to get rid of your leaves and not worry about them till spring and then pull them off right. well, also Gail Langalotta who is the current uh, master gardener coordinator for the state yeah uh, one of her specialties is pollinators and bees and she said that if you clean your beds and they're just perfectly clean uh, with no leaves and no mulch and no anything, uh, that there's also not a home for uh, bumblebees to winter mm-hmm. over. The, yeah, the, the uh, insects that actually burrow uh, yeah. and they need a space too. And she has said that, you know, if you want to clean your yard, that's fine, but leave one garden that's still got uh, a lot of leaves and a lot of mulch on well, we rake the leaves in our beds, and the thing we find, especially in the spring, are the birds digging through the leaves. So <laughs> I've raked them into the beds. By spring, they're all back out in the yard again and <laughs> across the lawn um, because they're looking for those insects, and it becomes a food source for them. So, mm-hmm. But, you know, I'm also worried, too, that what am I bringing in? But, I mean, we deal with that all the time with powdery mildew sure. and especially mm-hmm. in squash leaves and sure. cucumber leaves. In the fall, you start getting powdery mildew, and when you take those off, you just, and if you need to take them off, you just throw them in the garbage. You don't yeah. want to add that to right. your compost. Exactly. Well, it just... Or you get a chicken named Coconut, and it <laughs> follows you around everywhere you go, and she was wonderful. I had no slugs, I had nothing. Every bed I worked on, she was right behind. And uh, I, there is a difference now that we don't have coconut. Aww. So uh, if you got a chicken that follows you, let them follow you around. <laughs> well, sometimes you feel like a nut, and sometimes you don't. <laughs> you so. don't. That's right. Um, so uh, with, with any gardening, though, it's it's a balance. Yeah, it's right. True. I mean, yeah, it's, it's like true. you're balancing out. You know, how perfect and manicured do you mm-hmm. want it to be versus you know beneficial aspects of it, and you know where yeah. where is that mm-hmm. that yeah, fine right. balance. Um, so uh, let's, uh, speaking of manicured, let's move on to lawns. And so for a lot of people, lawns are very important. And I know that there's been a push recently in the last decade or so to get rid of lawns because um, you can really do a lot more for nature, for pollinators, if you have less lawn. But some people love them. What should you be doing with your lawn this time of year, besides tearing it up? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Anything that's green, I mow it when it comes to lawns. I don't worry about a manicured lawn because I have almost an acre. Well, I have an acre. Um, So yes, if you want a perfect lawn, the smaller the better because then you're not going to work so hard to keep it looking good. Um, If you have enough room so that you can have pollinators in beds or in pots or however, we really have to 
be vigilant about making sure that we bring plants in the yard that attract pollinators, that attract birds, that attract insects. Um, I have hummingbirds and birds and all sorts of things uh, that, uh, that I purposely choose plants that will do well. There are the eco lawns, which I've never really, I know you can plant them, I've never seen anybody be incredibly successful at it. It's a great idea, uh, whether it works or not, I don't know. I'd rather see um, a whole garden of uh, wildflowers or whatever uh, than a, an eco lawn, because they don't really do it. We had well. a, a neighbor that did an eco lawn, and for the first two years it looked wonderful but like anything else there were some of the plants really kind of became aggressive and mm -hmm. so you end up with more clover and less of the small daisies mm -hmm. and so uh, eventually you, they ended up having to kind of mow everything down and then right. reseed right. and a lot of people it becomes discouraging and they just want to go back to grass again oh, so okay. well a couple things my uh, a neighbor I designed a yard for and we put in sod and three years down the line he's like how come it doesn't look like it used to it does it well if you want it to look like a sodded lawn you need to do it every year mm. because same thing it's going to uh, some spots are going to their sure. plants are going to die or uh, something's going to scrape a spot in the lawn and and or a mole is going to come along and make a nice hill or whatever and then the weeds are coming in and it just doesn't look right same idea with with a lot of shade people want lawn in the shade well there are varieties that grow best in the shade but it isn't exclusively shade so if you really want a lawn in a shade shady really shady area it's an annual lawn. You need to reseed it or overseed it every year. Well, Ryan, we did a story with J.B. Sod, mm -hmm. and you, mm -hmm. they came and they talked about seed, so. They did, you know, because you know, I, I battle with it. and we have morning sun, kind of afternoon shade, so I get a ton of moss mm -hmm. in my yard. So it, it's this constant, constant battle. I like having the manicured look of having a small patch of green grass, that, but it is, it is work. You know, it's requiring more, mm -hmm. it's requiring me more water. And then, you know, do I keep up on the fertilizer during the summer or do I kind of let it go brown? It's on the browner side now because I don't want to be mowing water, it all the, all yeah, the time yeah, and sure. watering it all the time and letting it go. But, you know, it does take take the work sure. where you need to be, mm -hmm. you know, raking, raking out and then raking out and thatching it and I need to be aerating it and then overseeding it. Know, and fertilizing it, but, you know, that comes back to that balance as to right. what's in, what's important to you in, in, in your yard. Right. And when you overseed it, um, you did lime, correct? I, mean, I did, because, you know, having a lot of moss here in the northwest, it's, you're going to get moss. I mean, yeah. that's what, what we get. And so, and that's a lot of times you can correct that with the pH of your, of your soils is a part of that. So I would put down lime in it to try to, you know, sweeten up that soil a little bit. And then I'll put down a, you know, thatch stuff out and moss out and then I'll you know get all the thatch out and then I'll put down a little layer of you know, like a, a peat or soil and then do a little reseed. And it I mean it shows I mean your lawn always looks nice I mean it's not it's not huge but right. it always looks beautiful right in front of your home yeah. and I think that people it's it's a little bit of work and it if you keep up on it like Ryan does it looks great um, so it's just it's just that maintenance like you do anything in your garden. And we have that, uh, the reason why people add lime is to, like you said, adjust the pH. We have acidic soil in a lot of areas of mm -hmm. the Northwest because of fir trees and everything else. And so that will actually bring the, the pH out of that acidic and make it more, you know, neutral. I guess, neutral and, mm -hmm. and conducive for a good lawn. So. Yep. The other thing that. is that I used to get a lot of questions in the, in the extension office about I have a sprinkler system. I turn it, it, it go, it's on every morning. How long? You know, I water every day or whatever. Mm -hmm. How long is it on? Five minutes at five in the morning. Not enough. Yeah. Better to water longer and deeper and not as often uh, because then the roots system will go down uh, deeper. If, if you water often, if the root system stays up at the top and and then if it does dry out or you don't water it then it goes brown a lot faster 
The other thing is if you live in a home that has a mature landscape and a mature irrigation system, you have to rethink those uh, irrigation heads because a shrub may be in its way. So if you have a big spot of brown and it's green over here, it may be that that water's just not reaching that spot. We're running into that in our front yard because plants have grown up. Sure. And so now mm -hmm. we're like, okay, we got to move some plants. Around right. Just because right. Of the plants water. or a different head, a different um, mm -hmm. to to be able to water it. Also, you don't want a one fellow. Actually, the wife called me one day and asked me. Um, what they could do because their husband poured the wrong, the, it wasn't fertilizer, it was casserole. Mm -hmm. And so he casserole the whole yard, and I said, well, six months to a year, and you might be able to. Casserole is. Uh, That'll it, do it. It, it pretty much it's removes steroid. everything and <laughs> right. it's granular or right. can be mixed into it. So, with that said, make sure any chemicals you have, any fertilizer you have, keep them in a marked container mm -hmm. so that you know what, what you're working with. That's a good yeah, reminder. You know, the label is the law. Read yeah. the, yeah. Read yeah. the labels on those, Don't read the application the rates, and you know, yeah. how much too. Yeah. So, um, so we're, we've got about five minutes left, so we'll, uh, we'll talk, um, we'll kind of wrap things up. We're saving some for in a few months, we're going to have Jan yeah. back. Um, care for you, you wrote on here, and um, let's talk a little bit about that because we care for the plants, we're caring for our, our gardens, we need to do a little self-care. Well, I started a program with Extension that that really went statewide and other places too called Making Gardening Easier. And um, I'm a prime example of aging. Your body is not the same as it was when you were 20 something in gardening. So uh, think about the design that you have, uh, whether or not you really want to maintain that, uh, whether or not you have, I have some pressure gloves for arthritis that you could put on actually your garden gloves over the top. You can use, you can put some pipe wrap on, on the handles of a shovel or a rake or a hand tiller or whatever you have to soften the grip because those old hands don't quite hang on as tight. You could, um, so maybe your eyesight isn't as good as it once was and you can paint the handles of your shovels yellow instead of uh, brown wood, which is like, I, I know the shovel's here somewhere, but where? <laughs> I've lost many trowels yeah, and hori horries exactly, in the garden. Exactly, exactly. So the post, yeah. there's a lot of ways. Um, they're, they're, the extension publications that I did years ago are still available through OSU. Uh, some are gardening with heart issues, breathing issues, uh, different hints and things that you can uh, that you can do to make it a little easier. But the easier thing is get some help. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, Jan, I mean, that kind of wraps it up, I think, for us this time. But uh, we want to thank you so much because, sure. you know, for a couple of decades now, you've been sharing this information longer through OSU. And for those of you that are listening or watching, um, you can easily go to gardentime.tv. We can click you to some of the links that Jan referred to. Or you can even go to your own computer and just type in extension oregonstate.edu backslash gardening and that'll get you to the Oregon State Extension website but as Jan mentioned you're going to find extension offices throughout the United States and they're going to have more specific information for your area so uh, be sure to check out the uh, extension service for your area uh, once again we'd like to thank Capital Subaru out of Salem uh, for sponsoring the podcast and we are now going to all go home and pack, and our next podcast will, will probably be bringing you from Belgium and Holland. So uh, we want to thank you all again for uh, listening and watching, and we'll see you soon. Happy birthday. your new Subaru story at Capital Subaru. We are like nothing else. From the moment you step through these doors, you see it, you feel it. We do things differently here. Our people, our culture, our customer experience. Tell us what you're looking for and we'll upgrade the way you shop for Subarus. When you're just browsing, need great service, or starting your next adventure. 
we're always here for you. It's your story at Capital Subaru, your way on the parkway.